God gives more grace to the humble and resists the proud. It hit me back there in the office a little while ago. God resists the pride. proud. He doesn't say he resists pride. I think he does. But this he makes personal. He resists the proud. Now just a minute. Proud is in, in a container. Is that true? Oh my. Is God order invading man's disorder? That's disorder. Pride. Proud. You say, oh, Lynn. I happened to walk in, to get the feel for where we're going today, I walked into a business this week, and I am not adverse to throwing a grenade wrapped in the word in the midst of people. You know that. Well, we just did it, didn't we? <laughs> yeah, we just did. So what did you do, Lynn? Well, there was four people in this business, and two of them were in the back, a lady and a man were in the back, and they were in debate. And the lady that usually talks to me was right in front of me, and I happen to know that, uh, that she's a Christian. Over here is her boss. Now, her boss listens to our conversation every once in a while. So, as I listened to this debate going on back there, I said, you know, you know what's causing that? Well, no, what's causing that? I said, pride. Pride's causing that. They were joking. So, the lady turned around and hollered at the guy, hollered at him and said, pride. And the man said, I don't know what pride is. You might put it this way. I don't have pride. I am not proud. Well, this is getting ahead of myself, but I am going to give you a test for pride or why you might consider yourself proud. It's a, it's a, it's a word test. It's a grenade wrapped in the word <laughs> thrown in your midst. Proverbs 13.10 says, only by pride comes contention. So if you're not in any state or never have been in a state of contention, then I would say the possibilities are you are not proud or have pride. But if you enter into contention, hello, you're defending something. Or you're promoting something or someone. So I said to the lady, knowing her theology, I said, now, can you get more grace? Because they'd be a fine grace people. I said, is, is there more grace? Well, there's grace to be saved. I said, yes, there's grace to be saved. I, can, is there more grace beside that? Actually, I will, I will clue you in. Everything that comes from God is grace. It's divine favor. So... Well, she didn't know quite how to bite on that because I was about, she thought I was going to rob her of her eternal security. I said, no, 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 no. I, I am not talking about your eternal destiny. Uh, you are aware that Christians sometimes act prideful? Are you aware of that? Huh? Ooh, it kind of makes you smart, don't it? And let's go smart more this morning, so you get ready. Well, because that's exactly what Zach and I faced when old Keith Moore was standing here looking at us. Now, is this a message of Keith Moore? No, Zach wouldn't say it resembles Keith Moore at all, only in maybe a little bit in part. Because you might as well know, I am not Keith Moore, nor is Keith Moore Lynn Winans. I... I it thoroughly enjoyed the man and his message. But I can't preach his message. I can only share with you what God gives to us. So, there you go. Uh, so, her and I discussed this, and I could see the boss keep turning, kind of glancing at us. The other two didn't slow down much. And I just went out of there. 
I really didn't mind throwing a, a grenade wrapped in a word in their midst. I don't know if they talked about it after that or not. But if he gives more grace to the humble, and we'll get to the text in a little while, and he resists the proud, I'm, we're going to point out to you this morning, persecution will come to the born-again, spirit-filled child of God. <laughs> but self-inflicted hardship we don't need. And if there's a way to pass on it, I want to pass. Self-inflicted hardship. And that will make more sense as we continue this morning. So here we go. God gives more grace to the humble and he resists the proud. You say, yes, sir, my God gives. He's the God of love, mercy, and grace. I say, yes, and amen. Brother and sister, this is a fact. It is so true. <laughs> then I will, I got in my note, I'll shout. I probably won't shout, but I will probably interject at this point. You are so right, but so incomplete. Hmm. He gives more grace to the humble or the meek. Jesus says, or you say, God, Jesus loves us all equally. He died for all. Again, I say yes and amen. He forgave all men on the cross. And if you want a snapshot of this, just get one of our welcome things, because I'm going to quickly go through what is written on the inside of the cover. I don't know how many of you have ever read it, but I'm going to help you out. I'm going to very quickly share it with you. Who was nailed to the cross? Jesus was nailed to the cross. They crucified him. Two, you and I were nailed to the cross because we was crucified with him. What was nailed to the cross? The curse due you and I was nailed to the cross. Our old man was nailed to the cross. The law was nailed to the cross. The results of that is believers have no condemnation. Believers are sons of God. Believers are joint heirs with Christ. Believers, their life is Christ. And then the one that concludes this is that which is the fathers and sons is also yours. I say, yes and amen. That's true. And all the scripture references go with it. Just pick, just pick them up or CK. She'll be glad to share one with you. Wow. So we receive from the Lord by grace and faith, and they are both gifts of God. So written in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Any man may come and receive God's gifts of grace and faith and be saved. The question remains, though, can you receive more grace? Let's go to James 4, 6. He giveth, what? More grace. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble, unto the meek. Wow. Well, okay. Meek is also lowly, but we'll get to that a bit later. So, he resists the proud. That is, the Greek of that is to view yourself above others. You ever done that? You, you're not going to confess anyhow. I wouldn't. Unless I felt prompted. I'm pertinent going to do it this morning. Pertinent. I think. By grace are ye saved through faith, that not ourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So the question remains, and here we go. He giveth more grace unto the humble, or the meek, and the lowly. Now listen. You and I, if we went, we're going to get to verse 7. Can we just give verse 7 and 8 or whatever we got together, the next, the next one? I want to show this. Here he says, submit yourselves. Submit. You got that? It only works with submission. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Are you submitted to God? Resist the devil, and he flees from you. 
He flees from God. No, he flees from you. He, he ran away from Jesus in the resurrection, the utter defeat of him. So draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, purify your hearts, ye double-minded. So I want to back up now. I want to go back to this. Yes, the humble is given more grace. The complete statement includes these words. God resists the proud. See, we got a reverse tilt to this. Satan runs from God. No, he runs from the name of Jesus in the hands of a, in the mouth of a believer. God resists the proud. Interesting statement, isn't it? Are you ready? Only our pride is our business. <laughs> the pride of others is not our business. Let's be clear. It makes no difference if I'm able to identify it. Oh my, oh, you get, you get to dealing with pride in your individual life, you're going to see it in others. It's just going to happen. Hang on, that's not your business. You can judge things and actions, but you're not going to judge people. You might be clued in sometime for a divine purpose. But take that for what it is for that event. So we don't have pride because we don't have contention with others. Mm -mm -mm -mm. The gospel is God's order invading man's disorder. Disorder by nature includes conflict. And we still got seven and eight here. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. I like that. Flee. He just flat gets down the road. Draw nigh to God. You draw nigh to God. You approach God. All right? You approach God, he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands. External, external cleansing. Ye sinners, purify your hearts. Internal cleansing, you double-minded. <laughs> I am not double-minded. Hello? What goes on? I want to do this, although I know I shouldn't. I want to say this, although I know I shouldn't. I want to, I want to, I want to. And so goes your I want us. You see, you're vacillating in an opinion or a purpose. You are double-minded. Bind says an interesting thing. Bind's dictionary in New Testament words, dealing with double-minded, says this. You're two-souled. You're two-souled. Your psyche is, is split. You don't know which direction you really want to go at times. James 1.8 puts it this way. Remember, the gospel invade, is order invading man's disorder. Here you go. A double-minded or a double-souled man is unstable in all his ways. You need to make fix decisions that's going to last wow what are you saying strong says this his ways or his road his course of conduct is unstable lw says it's in a state of upheaval now observe do they consistently blame 
others or their circumstances. We discussed it last week. Saul blamed Samuel for not being there on time to offer the sacrifice, so he functioned outside of his office. He blamed the people for bringing back all these people and animals. This man had an oversensitive respect for people. He liked the appearance. When Samuel said, I'm going to, God's taking the kingdom away from you, he said, why won't you go with me before the people? Like, yeah! Now that wasn't a very intelligent statement, was it? Ah, yuck. You got, the, you got the point, though. Probably Keith Moore wouldn't have said that. Or maybe he would, because he got a laugh that tickles you. Hang on. Whoa. You see, lack of honesty is a symptom of pride. You say, I wouldn't steal anything from anybody. Just their name. Peter's words supports James' words. 1 Peter 5.5. 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. Dress with it. Dress with humility. For God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. You, you begin, he's serious about this. This is not just something that you say, bah, yeah, okay. Listen. Listen to Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. Listen to this. Write it down. Take my yoke upon you. Well, I'm, I mean, I'm going to be yoked with Jesus. I'm not going to be able to get away with anything. Ah, got the idea. It's his yoke. Then he says, learn of me. You want to learn of him? Look at He says what you're going to learn. For I am meek. Now, that's not weak. I am meek and lowly. Oh, boy, that, do we really want to be lowly? That doesn't sound very cool. Meek and lowly in heart, of low deg degree or low estate. Absent of high-minded, haughty, and arrogant, by the way. If you do that, you shall find what? Rest unto your souls. Your mind, intellect, will, and emotion. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Or your task or service is light because you're functioning from a place of rest. You are not double-minded to soul. All right? Wow. Wow. Have you ever noticed? You're talking a lot about pride this morning. Yeah, I am. Pride is, pride is man's disorder. But listen to this. Pride is an interrupter. Have you ever noticed? Somebody says something, I interrupt. Why? I want to be heard. I don't want to listen. Mm -mm. No, 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 no. See, pride resists instruction or correction. Ooh. This week, I got an email. And it was a self-promoting tirade of psychobabble promoting themselves to the chief seat and promotion because they were right. What generates that? Because I am better than you or them or I don't have a issue. It's theirs. That is a basic lack of honesty. 
pride is generating that. Whoa. See, pride attempts to impress others. Pride is inordinate self-esteem. Pride is Satan's sin. Well, boy. Want more? Or just soon we button it up now? It doesn't get, it just gets more clear. Pride is self-righteous. Pride's self-interest is to elevate self, putting others down by judging them. Ever had it happen? Oh, boy. Now, here comes God's order. Are you ready for God's order? You're going to love it. Well, you're going to like it. Ah, You're going to accept it. I won't go any further. Romans 2.1, saying this. Therefore, thou art inexcusable. You are indefensible. He's robbed you of all defense. You are inexcusable, indefensible, O man, whosoever thou art that judges, for therein thou judges another. <laughs> now, read the next part. When you do that, you condemn yourself. For thou that judgest the same things. Oh, boy. Or condemn us. You're sentenced with the same judgment, the same sentence that you condemn somebody else to. Now, <laughs> Jesus is being a rather direct person and says what he means. He says seven words in Matthew 7, 1. And we'll go on, go on from there to two. Here's the first seven words. Judge not that you be not judged. That's simple enough. Got the point? Got the point. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. God's not going to do it. You're going to do it to yourself. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. So the measure that you judge is the measure that returns to you. Remember last week we said, you wonder why my life is as it is. It's a result of self-inflicted hardship due to the fact you judge, you condemned, and the measure that you give it to them is the measure you're getting back. I would go scrambling down my back trail and see what it was and see what I could do about it. Why? Wow. See, what it basically is, is another disregard of the law of love. Here, here is the interesting thing. Others will not be judged on the basis of your judgment. You got that? Woo! <laughs> Others will not be judged by what you say and do. No, you will be judged by your own judgment. Your measurement will be what measured to you, will be a form of that judgment. Now, I'm going to back up a little bit in time and tell you something that I had a chance to meet with uh, in the past with some pastors. And one day we went around the room. They were confessing they need. Half to three quarters of them had financial need. It was just awesome to me. Because we sat here without financial need. Everything in this place we make and do with what we have. The thing of it is, we start talking about this, you're going to have to remember to give God the glory. It's not you. You get to be a receptacle. You get to be a middleman. You get to be all these things, but it's God that's doing it. You see? Well, I'm going to confess. Can I confess and still be the pastor? 
Okay, here we go. As I heard this, because this was small churches, big churches, it didn't seem to make much difference. They all had a, or majority of them, sizable portion of them had a financial need. And I sat there and think, God's blessed us. And doing my best to shuttle any, any garbage away. Did you get it all shoveled away? I'm not sure I did. <laughs> okay, I'm sure I didn't. How do you know you didn't? Because I still had to deal with it in Colorado. What'd you do? I said, well, I wasn't too sure, but sick I knew I was. So I rolled both of them together over on the Lord and walked away a free man. You say, well, sickness had anything to do? No, that's not what I want to address. Do you know for the first time in over four years, in the last while, Christ Harvest Ministries finances went this way. To the point, I will confess, Bill. Not only did the treasure get a little, the pastor got a little, okay? Because we was well below what the treasure, where the treasure is comfortable. <laughs> you can say, oh, there's all kinds of reasons. Yes, there is. We spent money. Yes, we did. All these things we did. But we've done that for four years. We've been relatively wise. You say, well, what did you do? I said, I didn't much talk about what other people's problems were. But you notice, he does not look where? On the outward? Have you ever noticed? He knows what's going on down inside. You must have really been bad. I don't know. I want to confess, I don't think I was really bad. I was bad enough, or I wouldn't have had to face it again. I just checked with the treasure, and I says, are we headed back up? He gave me that look. I can interpret that look. After four years or so, the treasures look. I'm getting so I can read. I turned around to Brian and said, "Let me interpret that look for you, Brian." I says, "We're headed up. We're headed back up, marginally." <laughs> and the treasure says, "You got it." <laughs> so it is going back the other way. I will tell you this, you know, the last two weeks has, in my opinion, has been cool. This is not a cry for money. This is not what this is all about. This is getting down where we live. If you're going to tell people that we're four years ahead, then tell them it's due to God's provision. If you're going to tell them that, <laughs> let me just share this with you. Bill's, uh, you don't have to stand up. With April's payment, I will tell you this. Bill says, I'm surprised you haven't said it already. I haven't. We are, for the first time, under a balance due on a mortgage under 100000 You say, is that important? In a little over four years, it, the mortgage was paid down $156,000. Now we've had to bite the bullet. We've backed off a little on what we give monthly. But when we come to the end of the year or before and there's money, we're going to put it on there or in something else that the Lord appoints for us to take care of. You can judge things and actions. A person's reason for their action is for God's determination. You don't know what caused them to act the way they act. Occasionally, he might share with you his personal judgment based on him knowing all things. Have you ever had that happen, Lynn? Yes, I have. Yes. 
I was a Kroger store manager of a bigger store at Benton Harbor, Michigan. I was transferred to a little bitty store in Dwajak, Michigan. Now that is an ego buster if you was to allow it to happen to you to be an ego buster. You say, well, what'd you walk into? I walked into a condition that I wouldn't, <laughs> somewhat like your comment before church. I walked in to that store, Wednesday, double stamp day, groceries, all of them down the aisle, the produce rack wasn't set, and nobody in the aisles, nobody working on this stuff, and I seen the meat, head meat cutter, and I says, oh, Billy, if I knew him, we'd work together in the other store. I said, Billy, what's going on? He said, well, out there is your head produce clerk and your head grocery clerk. They're supposed to be stocking the stores, uh, the, the, the groceries. I thought, well, what about the produce? I said, where are they, by the way? He said, oh, they went to breakfast a while ago. I thought, whoop te do. So they walked back in. I suspended the head grocery clerk and put the head produce clerk on probation. You say, well, you're what's tough. No, somebody had to get the point. What was past is past. What is now is now. And I'd heard about another employee. And that employee I had to work rather closely with. And in those days, we was traveling on weekends, and God was blessing. And we was in churches, and, and we preached the gospel and sing, and signs and wonders would happen. And, and I'd get back, rev dried up, you know, rev dried up. So I happened to have to be in the office with this lady regularly, and I would tell her what happened on the weekend before. You know, surely she went to church all the time. Surely she'd be interested, wouldn't she? Well, she tried to talk me out of some of it because the signs and wonders didn't happen anymore. Hard to convince somebody of that when they're happening. Called the pastor one day. And he talked to me. I don't remember to this day what he said. But it didn't make any difference. It was happening. So I started one day to share with her what happened the weekend before. When up in my spirit... Out of my spirit jumped these words. Don't cast your pearls before swine. Now that brings you to attention. She had said things in the past that I wasn't too convinced was, was good, and I know it wasn't, but I was not made to judge. I, was, I wasn't doing that. When this jumped up inside of me, I said, you're calling her a swine. I tell you, frankly, I wouldn't have got away with it. Because I couldn't see the inside. He was defining the inside of her. What'd you do? I shut up. I didn't tell her no more, then or later. I had my instruction. You say, Matthew 7, 6 says this, Give not that which is holy unto dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. And that's exactly what she tried to do, was rend me. I've told you this part of the story before. I'm only going to hit very quickly highlights. Because you're going to understand, when you're in the kingdom of God, you need to focus on what he tells you. There was a meeting. All kinds of people were coming. All the employees were coming. Uh, my boss was coming. Uh, the personnel man from the main office was coming. And I, maybe the union guy was coming. And, and the people were coming. And what had happened that brought this to a head, one of the older employees had come to me in the back room one day. And maybe I was sitting on a case of peas. I don't know. Maybe it was corn. I don't know what he was setting on. And he says, I got a relative over here in the hospital. And she's had this fever. And it will not break. I said, what do you want? Would you pray? Sure. Right in the middle of the floor of the back room of this Kroger store, we prayed. He went to the hospital. Come back. Her fever broke. He did something that wasn't right. And so he got disciplined. Well, hello. His protector come out of the woodwork and called this meeting. And I was traveling back from Benton Harbor, Benton Harbor to Dwajak when ha, I met, I met 
Can I, I'll admit again, I was whining to God about this. You know what she's doing to me. Of course he knew. No mysteries. It's not right. No, it's not right. He didn't volunteer any information to that point. I was doing all the question and answering. Finally, finally, you see, the gospel, the gospel, his order is about to invade my disorder. Got it? He's, he said this, do you love her? Well, that locked me right up. Do you love her? No, I don't love her. There's no sense lying to him. You know? No sense. No. He says, will you love her? I looked at that seriously. I said, I don't know as I can love her. You'll have to do it through me. Okay. Oh, I thought, victory. Praise the Lord. Now he said, at that meeting, you don't say one word in your defense. Wait a minute. (laughs) Wait a minute, they're going to lie. Don't say one word in your defense. I didn't. It all worked out very, very well. But see, God's hand behind it. You follow him, but you're going to have to put ego, self-promotion, all these things you're going to have to slide aside to promote him, his plan. You say, I'm not good at that. Get better. He's got a provision. I couldn't do it. I'm probably not the only one that couldn't do it. I'm not judging anybody, but I, possibility. Anyhow. So, there you are. They tried to rend this. didn't work. A separation of Paul and Barnabas for the Holy Ghost-directed ministry as recorded in Acts 13. And we're going to spend some time in Acts 13 pulling out some highlights of this in regards to our topic. Acts 2, Acts 13, 2 through 4, and they ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Ghost said, separate. Separate me. Set apart from others by boundaries. You're appointed for a purpose. Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work wherein to have called them. And when they would fasted and prayed, uh, they laid their hands on them and sent them away. So they were sent forth by the Holy Ghost, and they departed, and everything worked very, very, very well for them and their ministry. Henceforth, forever. Wrong tilt. (laughs) What happened? We're going to pick up in verse 9 directly. Opposition from Satan via a sorcerer, a false prophet, who attempted to turn a deputy from the faith as he desired to hear the word of God. That is not the way to God's heart. To hinder one from believing. So, there's a startling action to the Holy Ghost and included inspired words beginning at verse 9. You say, Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. Can you imagine the intensity of those eyes? Can you imagine? Next verse, please. And said, (laughs) and said. Now, how did he know this? He was full of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost was talking. And this time, you are attempting to disrupt one of mine. So, Paul, in this case, just repeated what the Holy Ghost was saying. Oh, full of all subtlety. That's... (laughs) Despite trickery, so Thayer and Strong says. All mischief. Now, that does not sound bad. You accuse the kids of mischief. You ever been accused of mischief? (laughs) What? Okay. All right. Mischief. Have you ever been accused of mischief? Mischief. Mischief? Well, it's not what I'm going to... Usually when they're talking about kids... It's something simple. Nate, you ever been accused of mischief? I don't know. Roger, were you ever accused of mischief? Yes. Okay, cool. So it is, 
you, oh. So usually it's just incidental things that kids get into. They're in mischief. This word is nothing like that. This word in the Greek is malignity. Now that gives you a different thought, doesn't it? Or cancer, if you will. You're all full of subtlety, trickery, and cancer. I mean, what do you do? See, what's happening here, the inside of him is being defined, not by Paul. Paul can't see in there, only by the revelation of the Holy Spirit. He can only speak by the revelation of the Holy Spirit. Look here, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness. Wow. Will you not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord, to distort, to corrupt? Verse 11, and now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist of darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what had been done, he believed, being also astonished at the doctrine or the teaching of the Lord. <sighs> Whoa. Now, the church gets involved, the church of the day. Opposition from the church. You ever had any opposition from the church? Huh. Opposition. Verse 42 of the 13th chapter. And when the Jews were gone out of the Jewish synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of of God, or <laughs> divine favor, or divine order. You see, what happens, the Gentiles and these Jewish proselytes, and some Jews just loved to hear the gospel. You see, it was order in the midst of disorder. Verse 44, look at what happened. And the next Sabbath day came, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. Isn't that something? Now remember, all the Jews, the Jews' synagogue was allowed for this teaching to go on. <clears throat> they had support. Now then, verse 45, now when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with what? Envy. Envy. They spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. The week before, they was all for it. A week later, you've just, you've just ripped off the whole congregation or major portion of it. Or, listen, they all left us. <laughs> we take things personal. Wow. Let's back up to that word contradicting. To, Thayer says to oppose oneself to one or declare oneself against him, or my word would be judged. So the Jews of the congregation manifested envy, wrath, and indignation when the multitude, both Jew and Gentile, desired to hear the message they had rejected or in the process of rejecting. You see, the message threatened their religion or their tradition. They, the Jews, did not rejoice at the message of grace. They spoke against, contradicting, causing, and creating disorder. They blasphemed, vilified the message, the word, Jesus, using words of contempt and scorn, and they posed themselves in pride and insecurity. <laughs> Let me give you what. Let me revert to, to Keith Moore, illustration of this. You know, if they didn't modify the message, they would be here. You ever thought that?
They modified it over there. Look at all the people. They modified the message. Well, it's not yours. It's no business in your system. Let God take care of those things. You take care of the things you can take care of. I don't know how else to put that to you. That's rather direct. That's the way it is. See, these people, they just didn't express an opinion. You're not just expressing an opinion. You are mounting a judgment. Whoa. Those people condemn themselves. They pass sentence on themselves. They judge themselves unworthy of eternal life. Wow. Verse 46 and 47. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou should be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. Matthew Poole says this, All knowledge is ignorance, all light is darkness without Christ. I have set before thee a light. Verse 48, And when the Gentiles heard, they were glad, they were filled with cheer. They glorified or magnified the word of the Lord, and as many as were deigned to eternal life believed. Let's go back to our original. Verse James 4, 6. Let's look at it one final time. He giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resists the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble, the meek, and the lowly. Jesus says, I am meek and lowly. Learn of me. The gospel, the word, is God's order invading man's disorder. Isn't that something? Keith, Keith Moore stood about right here. Zach and I sat right back there and there was a clear shot to us. Now he didn't say the same words that were said this morning, but they were words very much alike in the same vein. And Zach and I took it accepted it, and rolled it off. Okay? It's unique. Because I think once we understand, we resist Satan. We do not judge the proud. The things, the actions thereof, okay. If we have a divine revelation, We'll also receive divine instruction what to do with it or not do with it. It's, it's an awesome thing. Well, is there any needs that we have to deal with this morning? Not that we're going to meet them. Jesus will meet them. Just as with, I remember, I stand right back there, up there in Colorado, and I just rolled it. I mean, it was so clear, I was there facing, I just rolled it and went this way. I mean, just as real, just as real as can be, rolled it. Just rolled it rolled it. Wasn't mine any longer. There's more than enough grace to go around. More than enough. And if grace comes to the humble, more grace to the humble, the meek and the lowly, 
then it's up to us to be that. Because what else is going to happen is purely a product of grace. That's all there is to it. Father, this morning, we are, again, it's good, it's, it's been a little blunt this morning. It's your order. You, in Colorado, invaded my disorder. I don't know where that disorder went. It's rolled off of me and I don't care, as long as I don't have it. Let each one of us this morning, as you speak to us, roll, as it were, our load to you and walk away with victory. Walk away with glorious victory. It is what you plan for us. It is your provision for us. I accept that in Jesus' name. Amen.